Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are on site in, ba in Boston, Massachusetts, in Cambridge. We are at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We are sitting down with Dr. Woody Flowers. Hello. Good to see you. Thank you for coming on to the show. Welcome to MIT. I love being at MIT, and I also Me love too. being with you. This is I'm really excited for our interview. Um, okay, so background on Woody. Woody, for the last 45 years, has been here at MIT doing mechanical engineering, professing. He's a P Pilardo, uh, per Emeritus Professor of Mechanical Engineering here. That's right and lots of uh, inspiring students here to, to build the future, and also uh, co-founder of First Robotics, which is inspiring millions of, st of kids around the world uh, to mechanically, electrically, computationally design and engineer robots to complete objectives on playing fields, building teamwork skills, all this kind of stuff. We've talked about First a lot on our, on our show, and Woody's background has so many other epic things. Um, he is a, a, a co-founder of a company called MedMinder, and there's a bunch of other cool things in there with, an, um, with the National Academy of Engineering uh, member there. There's, it'll take me too long to list all of Woody's epic accomplishments over the years. And I'm really excited to be doing this to be doing this interview on site. Um, <clears throat> Woody, I really want to start uh, by talking to you. Also, can't forget about the um, 2017 Vex Robotics STEM Hall of Fame. Uh, there's so much cool stuff in here. Um, okay, let's start talking to you about your um, the, your love for mechanical engineering. So, when you were young, when did you figure out that? you loved mechanical engineering and why did you fall in love with it? I couldn't get a date, so I had to resort to mechanical engineering. Um, I was very lucky. My growing up was a very multifaceted thing for me. Um, grew up in a small town in Louisiana, Gina, Louisiana. Um, Gino was known for, unfortunately, mostly unfortunate things like the riots that were associated with the Gina Six and stuff. There was um, being black in Gina was not easy, and uh, so I was very lucky to have to live in a family where uh, we did not think that way, and we were dirt poor. And, but there was a lot of love in the family. My, my sister worshipped learning and athletics, and I was the little brother that uh, had a lot to live up to. And uh, in my junior year or so, we didn't have a car, so I couldn't date. So my uncle gave me a 1947 Dodge four-door sedan, a big, ugly thing that I drove home holding both hands on one side of the steering wheel because if I turned loose, it would go straight into the ditch. So I told my dad that I wanted to make a hot rod out of it. And characteristic of dad's manner, he looked at me for a bit and said, well, okay, Scooter, but if you start it, you got to finish it. So building a hot rod mm -hmm. was... Uh, my introduction to mechanical engineering. And my father was an interesting man in that he uh, was a wonderful inventor and builder and a creative thinker, mm. terrible businessman, but he's a welder. So we had a welding shop and, cool. uh, you know, dad would, he didn't have a peer review committee. So he would go around town saying, I'm going to take a framets and a widget and put them together and make a thingamajig. And everybody would say, Abe, you crazy son of a bitch, you can't do that. And he would say, well, okay, and then he would do it and come back and say, see. see yeah. And that was the way he rewarded himself for thinking outside the box. I think I probably emulated that because that probably gave me some freedom. But in the last part of my senior year, uh, my social studies teacher noticed that I couldn't fully extend my left arm. I had mm. fallen out of the pecan in second grade and... It wasn't exactly set well, <laughs> so, but the, the 
system said, uh, this is where I need rehabilitation. Sent me to a hospital 40 miles away and an orthopedic surgeon looked at me and said, you need rehabilitation, wrote a letter to the state. So I got a rehabilitation scholarship in the last part of my senior year. And everybody said, that's an opportunity you can't turn down, which foiled my plan to get a job in the oil field and buy a Corvette because they don't have a cool car. So went off to college and I knew I wasn't prepared. I had to take algebra and trig in college because I didn't have a good background at all. So I, I was afraid that I was not going to make it. So I worked really hard. And then I finished my freshman year and uh, then I went off to Louisiana Tech Engineering School and everybody said, well, you know, that's, that's hard. You have to really work hard. So again, I felt insecure enough that I worked really hard and that sort of stuff kept happening. I was uh, about to graduate and my friends were getting job offers from the oil field for $750 a month and I felt, wow, that's amazing. I can, I can help mom and dad pay off debts and I can get some clothes and uh, I can get that Corvette that I've been waiting for. And my department head called me in and said, have you applied to graduate school? And I said, what? And he said, you should, and I did. And then I got admitted to MIT, and everybody said, that's an opportunity you can't turn down, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then the same thing happened with joining the faculty. And during that process, I, awesome. I had met Margaret, and mm -hmm. we, uh, we got married just at the transition from her ending her master's degree at Louisiana Tech and me uh, trying to get into the PhD program here. Yeah. And a lot changed. Yeah, so starting off with uh, uh, the hot rod and wanting to, yeah. you know, you got to you got to finish the project that you yeah. want to start, and that you had um, a father that was an an inspiring figure for you that helped you see how to how to how to see, limit to get through limiting beliefs. Yeah. And my mother was a role model for thinking carefully about other people. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that. Well, just that, uh, I, you know, my sister was valedictorian of everything she's ever been in, uh, quite literally, even her college class, and ended up being a ghostwriter for Senator Ellender when he was the senior senator in D.C. And um, the two of us did not end up with some of the racism that inflected the rest of the community. And neither one of us can precisely identify what part of the life at home helped us reach that conclusion. But mom and dad, but primarily probably mom with philosophy, was the big influence. And uh, yeah, so I, I thank her for that. And I thank dad for encouraging me to do things that seemed like the right thing to do. And now you you went through the process of mm -hmm. working really hard and getting into MIT, going through this process. You spent you you did your master's and your PhD mm -hmm. here, and this Let is go back to that just for a moment. But yes. you know, I think it's reasonable to argue that I'm a great argument for how imposter syndrome can be a positive thing, because if you, if you always feel like you're surrounded by people that are more qualified than you. Mm -hmm then you're probably going to try hard. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly been the case for me. I have literally, I mean, I don't have any doubt about the fact that uh, at, in my career, I've been lucky enough to be surrounded by really smart people. Yes. And that's intimidating. And intimidation can be helpful. Yes. If it doesn't beat you down. Yeah. So I, I've told many students to make friends with the knot in your stomach. Yeah. Because if you recognize it as a stimulate, stimulant rather than something that you run from, then it can be helpful. But if it shuts you down, that's not going to help. And this is actually, this is a perfect, um, so I can actually, I, to, t to tie into this point that, that Woody's bringing up right now. So, so, you know, Woody has these all different types, and you can see this in in, in, in here, Woody has so many different mechanical engineering designs that, that help with 
uh, with the process of, 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 an, of, an, of engineering. And w- so this is when Woody says, you know, sit, around, sit across from people, pass time with people that have a greater intelligence than you do across different disciplines and learn from them and really uh, make that a key principle of what you do, surround yourself with very smart people. Woody, immediately when I came in here, started pointing out all of these different engineering uh, gadgets that he has in here that are designs for how to um, how to how to m- make uh, products and services um, much uh, more effectively into our world. Um, Woody, what is this one again? Well, that's a Smith coupling, and it's uh, coupling. It's good for transferring rotary motion from one to the other when the shafts are not aligned, and you know it does kind of counterintuitive things. It behaves in an odd way, but. You, one can't be creative about devices unless you have a vocabulary of stuff. You, you know, a uniquely human characteristic that's really important is making loose analogies and jumping from one venue yeah. to another, yeah. crossing metaphors and things like that. And so getting curious about stuff is a fundamental part of growth. Yes. Yes, and so I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, it's a key principle with what we do and who we sit down with um, and uh, constantly aiming to um, make ourselves more comfortable with the uncomfortable and then um, it, uh, keep surrounding ourselves with people that we can learn from uh, on, a, on, a, on a transgenerational wisdom dissemination basis and, and growth. Now, I want to. I want to talk about this. You ended up, pi- you can You you ended up pioneering a really popular course mm-hmm. here. Um, you. you th- this was a. Th- you did it for thirteen years, and it was. It was this. Uh, it was a. It was the course that was. Uh, that was. It was. What was it called? Design and engineering. Uh, co- actually, I, I, it went through some name changes, but I think. Introduction to Design? Yeah, Introduction to Design was the one that settled on after a while. It was Design and Manufacturing 1, I think, maybe when we first started, but, uh, you know, I don't remember exact. 270, 2.70 was the MIT language for the course. course. The students never used a name. Name (laughs) for 2.70, yeah. yeah. And then this was... And now it's 2007, by the way. 2007, yep, and changed. And Mm -hmm. then, so this was from uh, 1974. To 1987. Yeah, actually, I started working with the course probably 1968. Yes, yes. So yes. as a graduate student, I, I was a, it, yeah. a student instructor. Yes, a student yeah. instructor, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, to the professing side, a couple about yeah. five years later or yeah. so. And then, so so what? This is very interesting, and I think this is really important to talk about because this is kind of a lot of the mentality that you bring into first mm-hmm. robotics. Um, but so now, now teach us about the, this course, this introduction to design course, because you had students solve a complex challenge with robotic engineering. Mm-hmm. So yeah, teach us about this. Well, <clears throat> when I was a student, I had a very poor academic background but I had used a a hammer and bent metal and I had made things. I had done a lot of engineering and learned a lot of engineering from my father, although my father was only a high school graduate. He, so when I was studying mechanics and people were teaching us about Poisson's ratio, that meant something physical to me. And I think I believe it's complicated topic, and I don't want to oversimplify, but we learn engineering principles altogether too often by going to the symbolic manipulation mathematical language and saying, this is the explanation, and then coming back and say, see what that means about the physical world. I had an advantage because I had the physical insight because I'd done it, not because I was smart or anything, but it was just part of my background. So the stuff that we were doing in symbolic manipulation meant something. It was more believable. It was more tangible. Some of the kids that came from much more uh, advanced high school backgrounds hadn't done that. And they were left with, they may have made 100 on the test, 
and knew how to do the symbolic manipulation, but they may not have known how to use that to estimate, model, think about. So mm -hmm. here, uh, <clears throat> when I was first involved in the 270 course, the department head, the person who became the department head later, a wonderful man named Herb Richardson, um, had heard about a thing called a creativity kit that I think Xerox maybe had done at Xerox Park. So we gave the students a creativity kit and said, make something useful. The creativity kit was a bunch of paper clips and rubber bands and things of that sort. And my office mate and I were both teaching sections of the course and we watched our students really struggle with what am I going to make? That's a big, hard problem. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most sophisticated things a designer ever does yeah, yeah. is decide so, what to design. So and they have to dedicate their time. They, they would flounder, 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 yeah. flounder, and finally the night before try to make something. Interesting. So my office mate and I, Don Margolis, and I said next year, let's give them the problem. And oh, oh! I instead of just from yeah, let's let's say this whatever. is the problem. Build something to do this. Ah. Design and build something to do this. And yeah, we did yeah. that, and that That's was the cool. genesis of, you know, the, the competition. And the first year we did it, I built one myself, and that was I had a key to the student shop, so I could go in. Oh. I could go in at night. So I went in the night before, and the thing was to build a machine that would essentially move continuously down a ramp, 30 degree ramp, Okay. in as near three minutes as possible. Okay. So I made a clock. Everybody made clocks without realizing they were making clocks, but uh -huh. you were. So as the wheels moved, rotated this escapement, operated through this, torsional pendulum to huh. move down the hill. And this was the tuning to change the natural frequency of this pendulum by moving the weights in and out. Okay. And it worked, I was very happy. It was hard to do because I made the, the escapement by filing <laughs> part of a gear that was in the kit. And in order to make the escapement work, I had to drill a hole down the middle of one of the paperclip wires to make a little roller bearing Whoa. to operate the escapement. And after the students did their competition, I put mine down and it just slid down the ramp because there had <laughs> been sand in the kit and sand was on the ramp. It wasn't on the ramp when I tested the night before, so it didn't stick. And that was the best outcome that we could have hoped for because that was exactly what, uh, you know, the, the, the instructor got snared by an unexpected thing too. So <clears throat> that was, it seemed to work. You know, the students got a lot of insight out of it. Um, and the next year, we learned a lot. And we started learning that there were, if you would like to have someone learn about themselves, learn that they can be creative, then you really don't want to give them the wrong kind of exercise. After we became fairly well known for doing this mm -hmm. stuff, I'd have faculty from other places come up and say, well, I had, this, I had this consulting job that I couldn't do, so I gave it to the students as a creative exercise, and I'd want to punch them out. It's a terrible thing to do. I mean, if you couldn't do it, why, the, why would you take this precious opportunity and teach somebody that creativity won't solve a problem? Mm -hmm. So a good mm -hmm. creative exercise must be possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Must be possible in many ways. Mm -hmm. Everyone succeeds, but a gradation of success. Mm -hmm. The whole bunch of must not have a killer, complex, obvious answer that everybody tries to get through and can't make work. Yeah. You'd have gradations of value in different ways to do it. Yes. So thinking carefully about how you structure a creative exercise yes, is important. Yes, yes. And true education is not about consuming codified material. I hope we'll come back and talk more about yes, that. But yes. true education has to do with helping someone come to know 
helping someone develop a self-image that allows them to know from personal experience that they can do something that is creative or new or hard, etc. So you make that list of different things you'd like for them to know about themselves. But the most important transcript is not what's written in the registrar's office on a computer file. It's what a person knows about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think universities should get out of the business of keeping transcripts. There should be a blockchain account that you own mm -hmm. that you can let somebody look at. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's a, of a different of branch. things <laughs> that you've potentially created. Well, and, and that, that's, that's the stuff that you really want to. If I were going exactly. to ask you for a job. Correct. I should be able to say to you, here, you can look all the way to the bottom of my record yes. and see what yes. you want. Or I could let you see, you can learn all the exercises that I had completed in this software package. Yes, correct. Or whatever. Correct. But From all the way uh, through all of the different um, mechanical engineering yeah. uh, um, components that, that you understand to the software that you've worked with and again, keeping a log of all of the interviews yeah. that I've done. Yeah. So these are the ways to potentially create right. an analyst. And then you also made this really interesting point about gradients mm -hmm. in the creative process and, and making sure that a challenge is gonna be leading students um, to something that they better understand themselves, that they better understand how uh, engineering actually works to solve mm -hmm. important challenges. There's, like you said, gradients of success uh, along, that, along the way. There's a bunch of different ways to solve it. This is all extremely important, and it also has made it so that the, the students that have been taking your course um, as well as now are going through the process within FIRST Robotics are, are solving some really pressing challenges while learning a tremendous amount about strategies that they can use that are applicable across a wide array of, right. of engineering design tasks. Yeah. Yeah, the the knee-jerk comment is you're not going to get a job solving the problems at the end of the chapter. So, you know, that's, that's not what you're preparing yourself to do. And uh, the other axis of that process was so spin a long tail about how 270 became well known while I was helping with the course and another faculty member were was in charge of it while I was still a graduate student uh, we saw the local news media come in and <clears throat> the video crew would kind of interrupt the process and be a little <clears throat> overbearing and then that night on the evening news the two co-anchors would chuckle knowingly and say things like, well, what are those nerds at MIT doing now? And it was all an incredibly worthless, condescending statement about what the students were doing, despite the fact that there was some really solid pedagogy yeah, involved. Yeah, being done, yeah. So yeah. I told the news office when I became in charge, just don't tell anybody we're doing it. And so for quite a few years, we, we were stealth. Yeah. And then the folks from Discover the World of Science came and said, we'd like to do a, a program about uh, the competition. And during that time... Was that PBS? Uh, it, was, it was aired on PBS, Air, yeah. yeah okay. uh, Bester Cram and Steve Asher had done a 16 millimeter film documentary about one of the years. Mm -hmm. And it was very well done. It was a 30 yeah. minute uh, thing. And it would, you know, except for the effort that we went to to clean up the student's language. <laughs> it was in a time when things were in turmoil and uh, the halls of MIT were painted with lots of stuff and it, a very interesting time. But um, yeah, yeah. so it was very clear that if you watched that video, there was some serious stuff happening. And uh, we, uh, so they came and said, we'd like to do it. And I said, no, thank you. And the producer went away, and later the owners of the company came back and said, we'd like to take you to lunch, and we'd like to talk about this. So I explained what was going on, and they said, well, look, we're talking about a 16-minute or so piece that would be aired, and we're serious about this, and et cetera. And I said, okay, write a letter to the students, and I'll ask them if they want to do it. And so they did, and the students said, yes, let's do it. During that time, I told the students that when you're doing this stuff, imagine that your grandmother is going to watch everything that you do as part of a nationalized television documentary mm. and see how that feels. 
Mm. And they did that so well. I mean, it's just amazing. It was sort of, I was expressing what they were already doing, but I started calling that gracious professionalism mm. because it was compete like crazy, yeah. which MIT absolutely yeah. students will do, but treat each other kindly and in the process. And they took great pride in teaching everybody else what they were learning. Yeah. So that spirit is so much more important than lots of other things that could have happened. And that was, um, it's a wonderful thing to watch happen. Compete cool. like crazy and be kind and cooperative yeah, be, yeah. and teach help other people other. what you're learning, help yeah. each other. Yeah. That's a, that gracious professionalism has now uh, been going on for 30 years with FIRST Robotics now, mm -hmm. but even per, prior to that was a big principle of MIT um, with your work here. That's so cool. Um, you you had also, this is, this is actually a really important point, but this is obviously a, a, vi a video show and when you bring up news anchors and short sound-bited segments laughing at the nerds at MIT, mm -hmm. we're so beyond that. And I'm really excited that we're beyond that with capturing conversations like what we're aiming to do here right now. Um, we're moving away from these sound-bited, sort of uh, click-baity, um, <laughs> echo chambery type Things where we're not paying respect to the science and technology leaders that are actually building the uh, automation processes that are solving some of the pressing challenges and uh, increasing the standard of living for humans around the world. So um, I think we're evolving to gr more uh, better understand the importance of, of what's actually happening within the doors of, of MIT as well as within the um, classrooms of students that are in STEM around the world. So that actually, that sort of um, design process for, for, for students that was here as, at, at, at MIT um, in, in your course is actually now carried into FIRST Robotics. And I guess prior to getting to, to FIRST Robotics, can we, let's talk quickly about um, your professing here at MIT, mm -hmm. I want to know what have been some of the most profound takeaways as a teacher and professor to thousands of students? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, don't, I don't like to think of myself as a teacher. Uh, I like to think of myself as someone who tries to create an opportunity for someone to learn about themselves. Mm -hmm. So orchestrated doing yeah. is, um, is a better model, I think. So let me morph that somewhat into my th thought about what we need to do about the education system. Um, being a young person now, if you're paying attention, it's very daunting <laughs> because by mid-career, if you make a reasonable projection of what's going to happen, things are going to be very different. And yeah. the number of things that, so, you know, I, at the first kickoff this last weekend, I gave a little pitch that said, Dean talks about first being the hardest fun you've ever had. So fun gets lumped together into groups and it becomes joy. And joy evolves into happiness and happiness, if it spans well, ends up being satisfaction. And satisfaction together can end up being a meaningful life. Yeah. And in the first context, I said, if you do all that in, as a gracious professional, it all works well. That hierarchy is, is really very important. Um, you have to know enough to think well about what you're trying to do. You have to be able to make a deal with society that says, I give you this, if you give me back, need me and love me. And those are the really high value pieces. Mm -hmm. Getting to that point is getting to be tougher. Most of what I, you know, yeah. over there on that wall is a whole bunch of homework files that are still left over from graduate school, for, for example. You know, almost everything that's in those books is now reduced to one keystroke on a program. Mm. Do. What is it that students are learning now 
that will still be good barter material with society in mid-career. What uniquely human things will still be uniquely human some years from now? I worry about uh, Yuval Noah Harari's use of the term useless class mm -hmm. because we humans don't do well when we feel useless. Mm -hmm. We start misbehaving in very destructive ways. Yeah. So I have told the, the first kids for a long time now that you're going to be successful because you're doing the right stuff. You're working really hard to learn everything you can and you have the right attitude about how you fit with society. You are a gracious professional. But if you want to be successful in a life, in a place that you'd like to be in, every one of you has to figure out a way to pull at least a hundred others with you. Yeah. And boy, is that hard. That's really complicated. Yeah. And some may be able to do it by curing cancer mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know, making some major breakthrough. But there's a whole bunch of activities that we still need to upgrade so that they make sense. So I, th I see the whole education system has a big problem. And my proposal is relatively simple, I think, <laughs> is that we must recognize that training and education are different. They do overlap, but learning calculus is training. Learning to think using calculus is education. Learning a CAD program is training. Learning to design is education. Learning a coding language is training. Learning to be an efficient, reasonable programmer is education. Mm -hmm. Learning the algorithmic thinking. There's a whole bunch of things that parse that way. I am absolutely convinced that an AI augmented digital system will be a better trainer mm. than a human because it'll be adaptive, it can be one-on-one, -on -one, it has broad, broader bandwidth than a yeah. human ever do. We can democratize, mm -hmm. we can make that available to very large number of people and we may have to do that by having the people that can pay, pay, and the people that can't pay, not, yeah. but you, you yeah. know, we have to do it well, yeah. it has to be really, so export training to machines, mm -hmm. focus residential programs or in-school programs in particular on stuff that requires presence, you know. We can't afford to use presence, our most valuable asset, to do training. So that means that when you get people together from the teachers, which I've put in quotes, and peers, you learn about yourself. And if you develop a self-image that includes knowing from personal experience that you can yeah. do something difficult, do something creative, do something ethically complex, do something unpopular, do something with others, for others, etc., then you're making a lot of progress. And at many times during a career, you must be able to reach over into your now well-informed self about how you train yourself. If you needed to go learn thermodynamics, mm -hmm. do it. Go learn the codified part of thermodynamics come back and let's talk about how we're going to use that understanding to do a new heat transfer solution to solar panels that are so efficient that are, you know, et cetera. There's a couple things that you brought up there that are so crucial. Um, the first one that you brought up was the fact that this word teacher is actually more about enabling new minds birthed into the world to, to have their perspective be augmented to, to see the world in new interesting lenses and ways and then um, and then have them go through processes of tinkering and actually hands-on learning where that knowledge becomes um, ingrained and then they can go and teach others and go and build with it. That was really interesting and I think that's extremely important. Then you also, again, the second part is kind of like that you said, you got to bring a hundred people with you to this new way of seeing reality so that if you do potentially uncover something really interesting that you can, that a challenge that you can solve, you said cancer, that's, you know, biotech, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's something related to the space economy or a new protocol for programming a blockchain, something like that, that you pull more, uh, more mm -hmm. young people with you to see the world in that, in that way and potentially build that with you. They build their own after they learn. So that's a really important point. 
Um, and then there was another um, point. Well, it kind of leads into this, this, um, this last, this, the, well, the transition into, into first a little bit here. But um, it seems as though that this, this essence of, of, of the importance of, of, uh, of, of education versus training. I, I want to actually talk about that um, later with mm -hmm. automation and, and AI okay. um, because that, let's go to first and then we'll get there. Okay. Because, um, so, for, so, so this, this, this preparation of youth as young as six years old mm -hmm. to start tinkering with building mm -hmm. and designing and engineering um, in Legos to start, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and there's still even some block-based programming uh, involved, like component-based programming, which is very interesting um, for young. So as long as young as six, as old as as eighteen, are are designing and engineering robots to complete objectives on playing fields. Uh, half a million kids a year, eighty countries, hundred countries now, hundred yeah, countries, exactly. sixty thousand teams. Um, and there's you know 50,000 robots that mm -hmm. are actually um, being engineered and designed and to complete these objectives and like this year's theme is space everything mm -hmm. space related and again this is what's what's going on we're going to the space economy so the kids are learning how to complete these objectives to get used to um, the to space economy so um, and they're not just designing engineering they're learning about the emotional skills the mm -hmm. emotional intelligences of teamwork mm -hmm. gracious professionalism um, they're also learning about how to make business plans and fundraise right. and be entrepreneurs in that sense and and um, work with mentors and coaches. So this is all building youth for the future, and that's why I've been um, uh, judging and and emceeing and game announcing and loving being uh, a part of the ecosystem of first for the last three plus years now. So teach Woody. Thank you. I. I'm, I, there's, there's 30, there are 30 years with FIRST now, and there's been lots of um, volunteers that I've met that have been involved for decades, and crazy cool. Um, okay, so teach us, so teach us about what the, you know, this, what we're going through with this transition, with this education and training, and how FIRST is actually getting us ready mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. Well, um, this will sound arrogant, but I don't think it is necessarily. I think FIRST is a reasonable model for what the education system needs to become. Absolutely. Because there's a whole bunch of features to FIRST that are much more representative. And I'll take a somewhat controversial position by saying STEM is so yesterday. Even STEAM is so yesterday. We have to be over the horizons, the Uber STEM, whatever you want, however yeah. you want to say it. But yeah. most of the education system's efforts in STEM is actually math and science training. That's really important, but it's not enough. That other stuff is much more likely to be the uniquely human stuff that enables one to intersect with society in a way that makes you have a meaningful life. So. First happens to be the mix that you talked about, and um, I worry that first is so big now that getting a very large number of people to embrace gracious professionalism and uh, the ethos of first that started a long time ago, we don't want that to get out of hand. And also, first needs to keep up. You know, we. If you look at the first web pages and stuff, there's still the term STEM is in there a whole bunch. We have to make sure people understand that it's more than STEM. Yes. It's not just STEM. And the kids in first do what I just described in the sense that they, oh, I don't know how to do this. I'll go to the digital wealth mm -hmm. pile and find it and learn how to do it and come back yep. and apply to this problem. It's, it's really interesting. So they're, they're taking the uh, scary part away from a lot of things. You know, when I was in college, uh, PID control, proportional integral differential control, was an exotic thing that you encountered in a graduate course. 
high school kids know what that is now. You know, wow. High school, high school yeah. kids are doing stress analysis that's way more sophisticated than I was able to do with Castigliano as principal and a whole bunch of hairy stuff and years ago. And they can ago. do that in yeah, CAD. They do, yeah, I mean, it's, it's built in, keystroke, done. So if, I mean, Woody's talking shelves <laughs> of, of, of stuff, yeah. stuff that yeah. is now yeah. automated. To, done, to, done. That's yeah. so yeah. mind-blowing. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in the way that that, it's very, just quickly, it's so interesting how the baseline of that wealth of knowledge has now went up so right. high and democratized right. to make it so much easier. Yeah. yeah. And it's so interesting. The, you know, what that means is, well, let me, let me, um, that's good news and the, it brings with it an ethical problem that we need to be very careful about. Let's imagine that you have a black box that can do incredible stress analysis. So you put a bunch of stuff into it and the black box does something and you get a result and you build it and it falls apart. And that this altogether too many examples of that happening. Can't forget to make the black box, how yeah, to I mean, make it. Yeah. And well, if you can't see what's going on, I mean, even if you write a Excel spreadsheet yourself, you have to know roughly what the answer is before you do that. So estimation is an incredibly important, uniquely human skill that's still gonna be relevant for a very long time. And we, we need to do that more overtly. And one of the things that first does you know, last couple of years, one of my main messages to the first participants is being right does not make you persuasive and being persuasive does not make you right. And a uniquely human thing that we must learn to do is recognize truth. Mm -hmm. And if you are in a team and there is a beautiful person who is very eloquent, that has bad ideas and is very persuasive, boy, they can wreck the team. Yeah because they can lead the team down bad. And there may be a person that's very quiet and never speaks up, but it's really good stuff. Yeah. So you better learn to dig that out. Yes. So you're gonna hear. One of the things we learned in the, in the senior design course some years ago, we were having students do these lightning pitches about various ideas. And they would do a used car sales pitch. Rather than discuss the design, they would say, this is the best, the most, this will solve all. No, no. <laughs> you're, just, yeah. you're trying to get your colleagues to pick the right thing, thing. to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exaggerating everything about it serves no function whatsoever. Yeah. But yeah. that was culturally wired in. I mean, you have to yeah. really beat on that to get rid of it. So we have to learn, you know, right now with deep fake and fake app and all the stuff that's happening, long time ago it became more difficult. You, couldn't necessarily re re believe what you read. Now you can't believe what you see, see. or hear or yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. So being a sophisticated consumer yeah. is much more complicated and it involves a whole bunch of stuff for which there is no formula. Critically thinking requires right. deep nuance, right. drive for right. nuance and multivariability right. and empathy, perspective taking, all this type That's of stuff so. to be able to build a complex understanding of reality that's mm -hmm. not in an echo chamber binary sort of mentality. Right. Um, and I think um, in many ways, like you, you really we started pointing at this, this flow that, that first robotics is not only f way more than just robots and um, um, in STEM, but but also it's sort of an in a in a way it's an ideal model for an education system where youth from starting the age of six are not only doing the engineering and design skills, but then they're also learning the emotional intelligence skills, the practi practicality mm -hmm. of business and entrepreneurship, all simultaneously um, while being gracious across countries, across mm -hmm. country lines. So there's a geopolitical. Right. Um, aspect to this as well that they get to meet kids from around the world and know that hey we're both human we're looking right. for the same things family health happiness mm -hmm. prosperity to um, and so that's also been something so interesting it's been profound seeing um, six to eight 18 year old girls especially mm -hmm. being able to pick up the fact that they love the yeah. um, stem and that they love uh, um, the process of, of of working together and building things well, into the world I yeah reinforce that in just a minute yes one of my favorite videos is of a group of four 
kindergarten girls in the White House with Obama. And he walks up and says, what are you doing? And they show their Lego-based robot that turns pages for people who can't turn pages by themselves. And in the conversation, he makes a comment about uh, how did you come up with this idea? And they say, well, we had a brainstorming session. And then later he says, well, can you change the adjustability of it? And, and they said, oh, it's just a prototype. So when you have kindergarten girls yeah, yeah. Kindergarten. saying prototype yeah. and brainstorming, yeah, we're making great. progress. That's great. And, and you, you don't, you know, that demystifies the stuff. You know, you can bring those things down to places in the culture where they're incredibly more important. And they make cool, they make engineering notebooks to show mm -hmm. how they got yeah. to the uh, designs and engineering. There's a lot to, to talk about um, with First Robotics. Can I, I, wa I want to bring this up um, with you, Woody, because I've brought this up so many times with First at its, at its headquarter mm -hmm. level, and I've been trying to get this to happen more. I want more entrepreneurship mm -hmm. in First Robotics. Mm -hmm. I think it's really tough because you can't just take high school kids um, and 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 because they they're on they're on tracks to need to go to mm -hmm. to colleges and and all this other kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So it's hard to 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 pull them uh, to pull them aside to become entrepreneurs in a, in a sense. But um, uh, it would be what would you say would be the ideal way to incorporate entrepreneurship more effectively into First Robotics to maybe where where kids that are 17 mm -hmm. can actually start executing the ideas that they have as products mm -hmm. into the world at 17 and getting them out there. And mm -hmm. maybe they want to start those companies and not potentially right away go to the workforce uh, or college. So what would you Well, my, you my response would be kind of complex. Um, in about 1974 or five, um, with Francis Lee, we offered the first entrepreneurship course in the School of Engineering at MIT. And in that same year or one year later with Dave Jansen, we offered the first product design course in School of Engineering at MIT. Um, I have a lot of respect for the intellectual complexity and sophistication of that. And to make learning entrepreneurship as real as possible, one needs to come as close as possible to really doing it. Yeah. And that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> and I know there are examples of where people do say the project is you're going to start a company and at the end of the semester we're going to have a profit loss statement and see how you're doing. That's a, that requires a lot of wisdom. Yeah. And so I'm um, more content than you that the level of entrepreneurship that's in first right now, in particular in FRC, where gathering enough yeah. money to be in right. the competition requires some very serious thoughts about budgeting, budgeting and money. fundraising and making sure that you get a lot of stuff done. We're so talking tens I, of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Of well, budgeting. I mean, yeah. and you, if you have a big group that's going to travel somewhere, that's, that's yeah. tough. Yeah. So it's, it's a complicated thing, and I, I think uh, being careful at pretending to be entrepreneurs, yeah. you can learn a lot, but if you really want to learn it, you do it. Yeah. And if kids are, in fact, trying to get ready for college and stuff, you want to be careful about how far out of the mainstream you lure them. I understand that that can be a wonderful experience. But, so. There's more and more, um, it, it needs to be a more clear option. Right. That's the yeah. thing. It's yeah. not, it's less so potentially mm -hmm. about, yeah, maybe luring, but more so just about it being an option. That this mm -hmm. moonshot yeah. that you have in your mind when you're in mm -hmm. high school can actually be prototyped and executed and brought to the market mm -hmm. when you're 16 or 17 and you can mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. a roaring entrepreneur at a young age and you can learn potentially a lot mm -hmm. more than you could stuck in a classroom because maybe that's the way that yeah. you learn and just to make it more of an option. I would like to see a prize model mm -hmm. potentially at first mm -hmm. um, um, where you do propose some sort of a maybe $100,000 through a sponsor challenge for the, um, mm -hmm. the students during the off season Right now is the season from January until mm -hmm. April is the season, and then um, uh, the build season and, and tournaments, and then that's for the first robotics competition. But then after that, mm -hmm. there's new things that you've introduced into the first curriculum. But I think that if potentially having a, um, a, 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 a 
of thousands of dollars in prizes for um, the off season could be very interesting in crowdsourcing ideas that are solving some pressing challenges similar to the X Prize model mm -hmm. um, that exists, and I think that could um, potentially spur off a lot of entrepreneurship. We'll see. We'll see. Um, okay, quick. Um, and you yourself also ended up. Um, doing some entrepreneurship with MedMiner and um, MedMiner. Yeah, I, I, I was an advisor to MedMiner, but I, I've been involved in several, you know, MyMO was uh, started by a couple of former students and uh, <coughs> MedMiner is, MedMiner is doing quite well. It's really, really yeah. very nice. And, um, and that's for, in, that's sort of for this process of, uh, of reminding um, uh, uh, the, it's like enhancing the, the code, the adherence process to taking uh, medications yes. as needed and sending reminders for mm -hmm. forgotten and um, and sending for the caretakers as well, sending reminders to... And that's a wonderful uh, yeah. example of the complexity of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, Iran Shevlensky, the founder of MedMinder, uh, worked with some other students at Sloan and they'd come up with a, a pill box that would help people that were having trouble remembering to take their pills. And he discovered in the process that I had given that problem to product design class in engineering some years before. See? And uh, you do it. Because my mother had Alzheimer's and she was in Louisiana. And I tried all these ways. This is before the web was around. But I tried all these ways to help her remember to take her pills. And mother would beat the system in order to make sure that I was comfortable that she was doing it. So she would go back and fix the stuff to make it look like she was doing it doing right. It. So yeah, she, yeah. she would cheat to try to keep me happy. Yep. So, yep. But it's very clear that you know, lack of adherence to medical stuff is a huge, huge cost. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. So the device is really a wonderful project to work on, but it's not the right business model. So MedMinder is doing quite well now because it is a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And the device is free if you use the pharmacy. Mm. So what people want is so hard to know in advance. You know, I, I have yeah. an enormous respect for what it's like to try to see all the way through to the customer. Exactly. To Very, what, and we, we yeah. males so hard. don't listen. <laughs> so one of the reasons we want more women in technology is because they're their empathy is much more upfront and they're more likely to listen mm -hmm. to the customer. And I believe that empathy leads to good products and ethical behavior. So yes, yes. My, so, my ethics are empathy based. Yes, yes. Taking the perspective of one of another. There's, there's a lot that goes into that with um, the ethical. There's a lot of ethical quandaries going on. So let's, let's talk about those. Um, there we're approaching the age of exponential technologies. Um, we were talking earlier about automation being in, involved in so many different uh, in industries. And these exponentials are causing a lot of, of they're, they're stirring up the, the work economy in very interesting ways and we have to adapt and change to not um, leave people behind and help, and help them uh, move forward. So talk to us about you know, your thoughts on the future of work and mm -hmm. what's going on with the exponential technologies and the mm -hmm. ethical quandaries associated with some of this? Well, I recently uh, published an op-ed piece in the MIT faculty newsletter entitled um, on nerd epistemology and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. I think that was the title. I believe that people who understand the laws of the universe and understand themselves and how you fit in society um, will be better equipped to try to deal with some of the really complex and pressing things that are going on. You know, CRISPR's a big deal, yeah. as far as I can tell. Um, I suggested in that op-ed that what Nerd epistemology to me is allegiance to objective truth as we know it. Yeah. And recently, um, Frank Grossman, a first supporter and wonderful man, gave me a glass ball, a glass sphere about that big, that is a 
super small model of the universe. Oh, interesting. It's so cool. Yeah. I mean, and so there are tiny, tiny, tiny spots in it that if you just kind of scratch, you can barely see. And they look, it looks a bit cloudy because of those tiny spots. It's a model of the universe. I, think it's a, I call it my human humility model. Because you, if you yeah. imagine that that's the universe and you were to try to find our galaxy, mm -hmm. it's really hard. Yeah. Wow, if any of you could find our galaxy, what are the chances you could find our solar system? Mm -hmm. And if you find our solar system, what are the chances you find our planet, etc. Mm -hmm. Despite that, and despite the fact that we've known that stuff, that that's the way it is for quite a long time, most humans still believe that we are the center of the universe. And that's just, that's just objectively not true. <laughs> so one of the things I think we need to do is learn enough about the universe to develop some humility about us. And yes. one of the reasons that I, I really appreciated uh, Margaret and I recently finished reading Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of an objective look at our species. One of the best books ever written, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's palpably acerbic in places. And you know, the, we need to think more carefully about our place. Now, that perspective is daunting. In fact, when I was a graduate student, one of my dear friends and I stayed up drinking beer all night to define good. And we, we really, it was hard, you know, and we uh, drank yeah. beer and talked all night. And at the end of the night, we decided that the definition of good is a function only of time to re-election. Hmm. And that's been robust for 50 years. So what one does about education in the United States or the world situation now is different. If you were the philosopher king of the universe, you might first wipe out planet Earth and start something else somewhere else. You know, just the time period matters. Yeah. So good is complicated and we're probably obligated to base our, our seeking good on empathy because that's a uniquely human thing. The, the, the yeah. universe that I just talked about is, is really big and it's perfect. It, Mother Nature does exactly the same thing all the time. You know, no matter what humans think, the universe is doing its thing. Mm. So that's great. Uh, I like how you couple together the universe, understanding the universe, and I like thinking about it like big history, yeah. evolution of cosmos, life, yeah. and humanity. Mm -hmm. And then I like how you coupled that with understanding yourself mm -hmm. and understanding how you can be your maximal potential in the world. And then when you combine those two things together with a deep sense of empathy that we are a unity here mm -hmm. on Earth mm -hmm. as this evolution of consciousness, yeah. thank yeah. goodness. Now from here, where do we go next yeah. and how do we work together? Yeah. Well, and, and that's, you know, like the universe is bumping along and what we think is not going to change it. But we have empathy and love and creativity and leadership and, you know, and we humans have looked over there at the universe and said, wow, I understand that. It's amazing. I can, I can use that to predict. I can do things with that. I can help other humans stay alive by understanding how the universe works. And, and that, that stuff, the uniquely human stuff, is how we can add value. And so thinking carefully about how that works. You know, the, when the Chinese just sent a rocket and landed a rover on the other side of the moon. Mm -hmm. The Chinese scientists that designed that rocket didn't have a vague idea about the mechanics of, of, of travel, of Newton's laws and thermodynamics for the rocket, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. They had it right. Yes. And you know, the European Union sent um, a, a, a device that found a comet and 
you know, it, after 14 years, the guys were sitting there listening, and it said, hey, I'm awake. And they said, wow, it's out there. And he said, you know that comet you sent me to see? I, I see it. You want to see a picture of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and the, I, I caught up with it here. Here's this little thing. We'll put it down on the comet. You know, that's amazing. So humans, humans have taken this thing that we use and developed great insight. But this thing that we use came to us through evolution. And it's got some bad stuff in it. The stuff that still, you know, was obviously rape propagated the DNA of some uh, ancient beings. Empathetic love and sexual violence are on opposite ends of a attraction to other humans scale. The only tool we got to sort out which one of those we're going to do is our intellect. Tribalism. Look at tribalism. Man, tribalism is very heavy. It's there because when you were out in the savanna and you agreed with your tribe members and you had allegiance to your tribe members, your DNA survived. If you were some weird dude that thought about truth, uh, maybe you didn't. So we still have an incredibly powerful built-in inclination to do things that others around us are doing. And you know, if you look at religion, it's geographic. You know, if you look at a whole bunch of belief structures, they have to do with who you're with rather than what you really, so. And could we, ex could we expand our circle, our community for Earth to the whole entity that is our planet mm -hmm. and uh, caring about each other in that, in that right. sense? And I think we, we, we're on or well on our way uh, and I think it will solve some of these pressing ethical quandaries that we have, but we got to actually care about uplifting and democratizing all at the same time and mm -hmm. increasing economic degrees of freedom. And we got to make sure that that's not going to happen unless each of us regards those others as something other than those others. Yes, correct. So, as humans, as yeah, humanity. Yeah. yeah, correct. As our fellow brothers and sisters on the planet. Um, but we also have to put our own oxygen mask on first as well, and that's a big thing that we see around us today. Mm -hmm. um, we we gotta we gotta take ourselves potentially away from dependency and more towards um, well d more towards making sure that we ourselves are able to figure out our our own. Pro anyway, there's so yeah. much there's so much yeah. to unpack there, Woody. I wanna I wanna go um, a couple of quick things on the way out. I always ask um, these questions. Mm -hmm. So um, this has been super wide ranging and interesting. Um, and I wanna make sure that I touch on this one. This is one that I normally don't ask, but I wanna ask you specifically. Um, what are you most looking forward to in mechanical engineering? Um, well, clarify that just a little bit. I don't wanna ask you to over define the question, but um, you mean, what about my profession would be a wonderful thing f aspirationally? Yeah, what, what do you see in the future of mechanical engineering as a sure. trajectory that, you, that you're most excited mm. about? Oh, okay. That's somewhat different, but let me mix cool. uh, answers. I would like to see gracious professionalism become part of the ethos of becoming a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it is not, but I do think it's fair to say that it's not given the attention that it should. And I'm somewhat frustrated that I'm, I'm proud to be a member of the National Academy of Engineering, but we National Academy members, the Academy was created to advise Congress. We're not very effective. The, I mean, the system did not come to the National Academy and say, write a report which talks about the likely effectiveness of various means of controlling the southern border or whatever. I mean, we're not in the forefront. Uh, the, the Academy has written many reports on climate change. Congress is not paying attention. Most of 
the government's not paying attention to what we're doing. As we so, gain more scientists and engineers in Congress, I think we'll yes, have a big and, change, yeah. And we, what, I think it's necessary, if that's gonna happen, that part of the profession of mechanical engineering must include, I'm going to help change society in positive ways, and if it means that I have to run for office, do it, but be part of the decision process. Uh, we, democracy is wonderful, but when we're being governed by people that are not interested in understanding, that's kind of scary. So we need yeah. to get yeah. people that are willing to think to be more influential in that process so that we make reasonable decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Bezos was the uh, honoree at the first gala in New York recently, and he said several things that were just really um, wonderfully insightful. He talked about decision processes and you know, if there's, a, if there's a decision that is revocable, then do it, get on with it. If there's one that you can never change, irrevocable, get all the data you can. Yes. And only go to your gut if you, after you've saturated all the understanding. It's a good way we, to put it. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to do that sort of theft stuff more. More often, and yeah. The, nerd epistemology part of how we think needs to move up. You know, society still kind of giggles at nerds. Um, but, you know, when I look out the window of an airplane and I can guess what most of those things out there are based on mm -hmm. some understanding of fluid mechanics and stuff, that's really satisfying. That's nice. Totally. So being immersed in yeah. something that you can sort of understand is a big deal. Yes. Yes, it's it's the un, it's so interesting that that you say that um, cuz I'm currently at Dan Brown's meditation retreat here in Boston and mm -hmm. I'm sitting in the room and I'm looking at the light and I'm thinking about the constant stream of photons being emitted from the light and then mm -hmm. I'm looking at the speakers that were Dan's voice is being uh, propagated out of, and I'm thinking about the sound waves coming from that. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the wood floor, I'm thinking about the trees that mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. cut and put in the wood. I'm thinking about the cotton in the cushions yep. that we're yep. sitting on and how mm -hmm. that grew. And so when you look at the 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 v, when you look at vehicles and buildings and and all different types of tools that that exist, and you and you have a, a pretty good, if not completely, understanding of how they work. It, it enables, it brings you closer to the truth and further away from the black box mentality. And you also brought the Jeff Bezos understanding of how things are, if, if you, you gotta gather as much data as possible about something like, uh, about the way that humanity's making a, a decision about artificial intelligence or about mm -hmm. climate mm -hmm. science or about, because there's only there's only one time to to to, to potentially uh, irrevocable. We, we need to get it right now. Yeah, get it right the first time. So just, yeah, yeah. did Origins summarize Dan Brown's philosophy? You know, Origins. Yeah. Of well, the, the, the book Origins. Oh, the book Origins. Or Origin? How do you, origin. Origin. Guess, yeah. Origin. Um, you know. um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. I do. I do know that. I'm starting to know that 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 awakening to the profound sense of unity is so gorgeous mm -hmm. the 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 feeling of love uh, and oneness being everywhere all the time and just us not fully mm -hmm. tapping into it now, because we haven't trained that muscle yeah, yeah. enough have you do you meditate With, have you ever, ever experienced oneness um, I, I I I believe I have uh, okay. uh, because yeah. I've been I've been doing this for a couple of years mm -hmm. now, um, almost three years, and mm -hmm. and um, and I would say that there are different ways up the mountain, mm -hmm. as is usually yeah, said. Yeah. Um, but when you start getting closer to a profound that profound feeling, 
and um, it's just it's just um, there's nothing quite like it. And then you kind of you 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 compassionately melt into how grateful you mm -hmm. are for. Mm -hmm. For life and for each mm -hmm. other, and there's nothing quite like it. It'd be cool to see more meditation in first robotics, mm -hmm. um, and with engineers and scientists in general, um, and also in Congress and the United <laughs> Nations. And yeah. So, have you uh, Michael Pollan's new description of the path up the mountain is really interesting. Yeah. So, did you know that you had a default mode network before that book? Uh, yeah. I didn't. I yeah. had never heard of it. Yeah. And I think his insight about the link between psychedelic drugs and oneness is really interesting. It's very profound yeah. and it's, there's also different ways up the psychedelic mountain <laughs> uh, with different psychedelics mm -hmm. and there's uh, in different dosages of those psychedelics yeah. Um, but the uh, dissolving of the default mode network, the interplay of different neural circuitry that enables you to potentially be more creative and uh, potentially um, see the world in new and interesting ways of that oneness is all very cool. And I think w that playing along with some meditation and um, it, 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 it's just Woody, it, it's just very difficult to to get to the point of of oneness because I think there's there is a um, how can I explain this? there is um, uh, optimists think about oneness mm -hmm. uh, pessimists think about a perpetual state of 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 we'll never get along and then realists understand I think that there's a hard path to get to oneness and it's going to require because earth is a complex system of 7.7 billion humans all trying to engage with each other and so we got to figure out how to work together to mm -hmm. get to that mm -hmm. point of oneness so i think optimists want it tomorrow pessimists think we'll never get it and realists say it's a complicated path and we got to figure out how to get there so um woody the couple quick yeah. questions way out um Spending a lot of time in computation, uh, I'm sure that you've con you've used simulations before. Mm -hmm. The show's called Simulation. Mm -hmm. We love yeah, asking right. people about the about. Do you think this is a simulation? That this is a simulation. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. I think probably not. Um, but. V.S. Ramachandran in, in the book uh, Phantoms in the Brain, his last chapter argues that consciousness is nothing more or less than your model of what's out there. Mm. I think that's probably right. So this is not a simulation, but you are. Because you know, my default mode network <laughs> has said, Woody, you're separate than Alan, and you're not part of that flat file. Um, and I have a model of what's out there, and when I die, that mm. simulation is going to shut down. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably reasonable, because I can't know anything about you being there unless yeah, if I yeah. touch you and I get some feedback that that haptic agreed with my model. Yeah, yeah. The downside, given what we're discussing, is that if my default mode network over constrains me to stay within my model or stay to make sure that the model of what's out there is not too expansive, if it exercises confirmation bias for what, it, you know, I, I like to hear things that I already think I believe, mm -hmm. then I may not get to learn as much. So. Yes, it, part of this is a simulation, <clears throat> and both of us need to learn how to modulate the degree to which we can test new things in that simulation. We can yeah. tweak the dial. Yes, yes. So, tweak the variables yeah. in the simulation, yeah. yep, yep, and, uh, and figure out how to maximize our, our character's potential in the, yeah. in the, in the, in yeah. the game that we're, that we're leveling up in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll, that's, that's a really great way to, 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 to put it, is that, um, that this is... Um, that your what you're running in your mind is uh, and the, the, the wisdoms that you have 
pass them along before the simulation mm -hmm. of you yeah. ends. And that's, that's actually the reason why this collective learning and knowledge of humanity, that's why we're here, because of the collective. We're mm -hmm. able to build on top mm -hmm. um, quite quickly. On the shoulders of giants. On the shoulders of giants, <laughs> that's right. Last question. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, probably the concept of beauty. So, and I don't understand it. Um, and, you know, it's evolution gave us this kind of fun thing. You know, the, um, the positive part of awe is a big deal. And I really, I really feel sorry for people that don't seek awe. Yeah. Um, like, you know, my going to the, do the zero G flight next month is because I want to be in awe of yeah. what it's like to be weightless. Yeah. Seeking, um, so my wife and I are amateur nature photographers and we love photographing beautiful birds. Yes. But the most beautiful thing is that, why does that beautiful thing give me pleasure or awe or mm -hmm. whatever that's about. Mm -hmm. So whatever that mm. uh, process is, is probably the most beautiful thing. Interesting. So our relationship with awe and why we find things beautiful yeah. is the yeah. most beautiful thing. Very, very interesting. Yeah. It's, it almost seems as though Earth has, uh, and the universe has, in a sense, made these things so just like beautiful for mm -hmm. us to, to, to awe, to get gawk at and be inspired by and um, right. yeah. And in some cases, you know, rather than say that God has a sense of humor, it seems like evolution has a sense of humor. Totally, yeah. <laughs> so, and what's the difference yeah, between, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, Woody, what a pleasure this has been. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on to the nice show. To, nice to have you here. Yes, it's been such a pleasure being at MIT in your office. Mm -hmm. um, and learning from you, um, just scratching the surface, we have so much more to understand about uh, mechanical engineering, what's went into your life and what's went into this process of, 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 of inspiring thousands and now you know hundreds of thousands, millions of kids now around the world um, to become leaders uh, in building the future. Thank you for that. And I hope, I hope your audience gets just a little bit infected with nerd epistemology. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. It's, it's so crucial. And, um, and we'll, we'll um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. And as Woody said, get infected with the spirit of wanting to build up this objective truth and reality and to manifest your destiny and your dreams into the world. Build the future, everyone. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, let's build a little community around some of the things that we talked about in this episode. Much love to you all, and we will see you soon. The Woody Flowers, I love it. The Woody Flowers thumbs up at yeah. the end, yeah, it's so good.